welcome. Uh, welcome and course. Uh, glad to see you all came in such numbers. Um, I think most of you already know COLOS, but I'll, I'll do a short introduction. COLOS is a digital agency and we're focusing on the full customer journey, so uh, not only web development, but a broad range of services all around digital and improve, all, all around improving the results of our customers. And um, that means we also do a strategy, uh, but we'll also have uh, recently Um, and we we'll also recently have released our new uh, services around artificial intelligence and yesterday uh, we released the chatbot at the nature so you see that the range of services we deliver is uh, constantly um, improving and getting wider and that's, uh, that's a very cool thing I think. Um, for content management systems we, uh, we use Sitecore and Umbraco and uh, of course we're going to focus on Sitecore today. So that's, uh, um, that's a good introduction on my first uh, on the first talk, which I'm going to uh, to host, uh, and it's about Sitecore 8.2 Update 1, which is recently released, and I'm going to show you how to uh, deploy Sitecore 8.2 Update 1 to Azure Web Apps. Um, first, a small introduction. Um, what I'm going to show you is a very early stuff. It, I actually prepared it while it wasn't uh, released yet. And I prepared it on the, the early access we had as an uh, MVP. Um, so we still had to figure out a lot ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, last Monday it was released by Sidecore, but it was released in parts. So uh, some stuff came on Monday, some stuff came on Tuesday, some stuff was kind of hidden and we had to go look and find for it ourselves. So by yesterday evening everything was ready and I could redo my demo on the new stuff. So there are parts that I won't cover yet because I myself didn't uh, discover this functionality as well. Uh, but um, I, I will show you what's in there and I, I hope I'll, I'll make a, um, I'll trigger you to find out yourself more about this, uh, this new technology. Um, as I said, um, marketplace and ARM templates became available yesterday. Um, and what first something about Sitecore and Azure? Um, this is actually a slide that I uh, I nicked from Sitecore, and it's, it it tells something about why Sitecore uh, should go Azure. Um, and there's a whole lot of obvious stuff in it if you already know Azure, uh, but. The scalability, the fact that it's always on, very easy. Uh, the speed to market is much quicker. You pay as you go, so you only pay for the search you actually use. And uh, the familiarity with Windows is, is great. It's uh, fully integrated with all the services and, and software you already use, like Visual Studio, Web Deploy, and, um, and, and we'll get to, to take a look in, into that a little bit further later on. Um, on Azure, you have uh, three ways of hosting, and that's uh, virtual machines, cloud services, and web apps. You probably all know them, I guess. Um, and uh, the cloud services is what the previous Azure module was on. Um, and web apps is the new path offering, the new platform as a service. Uh, I think two years ago, uh, this was referred to as uh, SaaS, as software as a service. But uh, Microsoft changed into calling it PaaS as well. So we would consider this uh, Sitecore Web Apps as a new PaaS offering that Sitecore has. And the, the Azure module is replicated by uh, this new version. So until 8.1 you can still use it. After that you, you can still use it, but it's not supported anymore. <coughs> so what has changed? Um, the now deprecated module required a lot of custom configuration and additional work to figure out. I actually did a talk on Subcom two years ago about this and it took me quite a lot of effort to figure out. Um, and now it was actually more work to install Sitecore 8.2.1 locally than deploying it to Azure. <laughs> um, so I was a little bit afraid I didn't have, some, I, I didn't have anything to talk about today <laughs> because it was so easy. Um, and, and someone today mentioned uh, what you're going to talk about, it's just starting PowerShell and then waiting for 20 minutes. So I said, yeah, that's, that's going to be my talk. 
Um, but I'll try to make it a little bit more interesting. Um, Sanko now changed the way it, um, um, it works with deployment. You were on your own before, and now you have a lot of guidance. Um, you have provisioning scripts for all the different seats, uh, the experience, uh, the XP, the XM, uh, and you also get sizing advice. So you, you really get a lot of guidance. It's a starting point, it's a boilerplate, so you can uh, customize it, tailor to your own needs afterwards, but it really gives you a good idea on how you should set up your environment. The old cloud services uh, required a lot of custom stuff. Your deployment took very long, like 20 to 45 minutes per instance. So if you have four um, content delivery servers, it, take, uh, it takes that time multiplied by the number of servers. Of course, you can do it uh, simultaneously, but still it takes a lot of time. Um, there's no automatic scaling. Um, we we uh, achieved the result by uh, using CloudMonix, a third-party software, but it's not out of the box and it certainly isn't easy. It didn't support all the modules and the maintenance was gone so, And that all changed. Um, it's, it's native, easy, scaling support. You deploy once per server type and um, and I, it says eventually, eventually Cycle will support all modules. At this release, uh, the first release, it still doesn't support uh, <coughs> the, the web forms marketers, for example, but um, they, they have promised, and I'll show you the roadmap later on, to support all the modules available. And it's very easy to maintain, of course, so <coughs> I, I kind of refer to it like this. Um, the cloud services were cool, but this is way better. So the outtake is easy deployment, scalability, and productivity. We're going to look at how to provision and deploy these web apps. The building blocks that you have are uh, these ones. Of course, we have web apps, and we use the web apps for the different roles, uh, content management, content delivery process, reporting, and they all are placed in a different app service plan, so you can scale them differently. Application Insights is the new uh, um, way of help inventory, and that means that your uh, file-based log uh, mechanism, the log files, are gone. They're not loaded there. On web apps, you don't want any dependency on the file system, uh, so all the logging is done uh, through Application Insights. Azure Search is the new indexing, uh, the default indexing and search engine. And that means that you can't no longer lose, uh, use Lucene as well, because Lucene also has a dependency on the file system. Um, you can still use other services, we'll, we'll get to, to that later on, but Azure Search is going to be the default. Um, a pretty obvious one is the Azure SQL, which is already possible uh, using um, uh, EAS or um, the old cloud services uh, offering. And the Reddish cache is available, and that's actually great news because uh, it wasn't supported until this version. Uh, you could use it uh, without XDB, but XDB uh, support wasn't there for the, the Reddish cache because there was no on session end event in Reddish. And that's been fixed, and it does now have support. It's very easy to provision and to configure. And the last building block is MongoDB, um, and there are actually the two most obvious ones are hosting it on a, uh, an own VM or uh, using uh, another service, uh, SaaS service like MLab, and that's the one I use for this demo. Well, there are more MongoDB services, but they, these are the obvious ones. And you can use uh, the uh, XDB Cloud from, uh, from Sidecore. But that's not related to, uh, to Azure building blocks. The deployment strategy is that you now split your provisioning, deployment, and hosting, and have a good separation of concerns. Um, you provision once per, per, per environment, um, set up the default vanilla environment. Uh, you can uh, you can scale it up to your own requirements. You can put more in the provisioning. You could put more in deployment. But the idea is you have the provisioning uh, separated from the deployment. And of course, hosting, all management around hosting is done via the, uh, the Azure portal and no longer is part of your deployment. An example of how you would deploy is that what Sitecore does when you deploy to Azure Web Apps, 
and I'm going to show you uh, this via the ARM template, is that it provisions all, surface, uh, all services, but it's also going to connect the services together. So of course you have the delivery service, um, you have the collection database, session state, which is Reddish, that search is being provisioned, um, you've got the content management system, the weighted database, and then all the connections are made. And this is all uh, uh, being run by default by the ARM templates that Signpool provides. You get your processing server, your reporting database, it, it connects to reporting <coughs> service, and it uh, adds health, service, uh, health monitoring uh, on top of that. Um, you can also see that this is a, a, a nicely scaled out environment. So if you use the default sign for scripts, you get a lot of instances which generates quite some um, um, costs on your Azure portal and takes up a lot of credits. So you might want to tailor that, but by default, it, it does this all for you and it goes all by, uh, by one command. <coughs> Scaling out can be done in two ways. If you know Azure already, uh, you know this and have probably seen this, it's very easy. Um, you deploy once per instance, but because the files are shared uh, between the different instances of one row, and that's also the reason you can't, you, you can't have any dependency on your file system, because all content delivery servers actually share the same file set. Um, you scale up manually by selecting the number of servers, or you can scale based on metrics. And you can say, if my uh, CPU range is out of 60% uh, or higher, please scale up uh, between three or six machines, for example. And you can scale up as well by just selecting another plan. This works pretty fast. By the way, the idea of the, the scaling is that right now you get the best result when you deploy to a single instance and then scale it afterwards. Deploying at once to multiple instances or an already scaled environment uh, is, is, uh, is more likely to crash the more instances you, you have. So, um, so it's better to provision the environment in a staging slot, one, uh, one instance per row and test it when it works, scale it up, and then switch it uh, from the staging slot to the live slot. That, that's probably what, what works best. Um, so, I want to give you an overview of the deployment process. Um, um, I also gave this presentation uh, a week and a half ago, and then this was breaking news. Now it probably isn't anymore, but it was, <laughs> it was quite some news that um, Sitecore also uh, came available in the marketplace. So without any technical knowledge, you can just select the sign for service, put your parameters in it, start it, and you have a vanilla sign for solution. Of course, you still need to install your templates and your uh, custom layouts in it, but it, uh, it provides an easy kickstarter. It's a, a site you came up with to bring your own license for this, so uh, you can't buy it in the marketplace. You have to have your own license, but you can select it over there. That's not what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to focus on the second option, and that's using the ARM templates and web deploy packages, um, which is the PowerShell-based deployment. And you can both do this vanilla or customize this, which, of course, requires technical skills, but I wouldn't call this technical skills because it's very easy to do and it's very easy to understand. For those that do not yet know ARM templates, it's uh, the default Azure Resource Manager template of Azure. It's a standard, <coughs> it uses JSON, and it's been used by Cypher as a starting point for your custom provisioning. Um, it enables you to, uh, to define one or more resources, and also the dependencies, which I've showed you in the, in the graph a few slides back. The dependencies between the different instances are also created with the ARM templates. Um, you can use it for initial provisioning, you can use it for continuous deployment, um, but I like to only use these ARM templates to initially provision my environment to additional deployments. Uh, I think uh, it, it's better to use uh, other ways uh, like web deployment packages or just a regular web deployment. Um, and um, um, the templates use a web deploy and backpack package to set up the site and database. I'll show you in a minute how that's been, uh, been put together. Um, the 
prerequisites are quite um, uh, to list is that long and it's quite easy. Uh, you have to have uh, PowerShell 4 with the latest Azure uh, commandlets, uh, a dotnet framework for 206 installed, and a running MongoDB instance. You, you have to uh, get the MongoDB running before you start the revision. There's some links in it, but of course they are. Uh, they are for later on when I share this presentation. Um, the second one was actually um, someone we found um, later on. It's the ARM templates were not really mentioned in the documentation, but Boss found it. I think Boss found them first, and uh, uh, now we all can uh, can use them. Um, so, what's Azure PowerShell? Uh, Azure PowerShell is a set of commandlets to manage Azure from your PowerShell uh, instead of using your portal. The commands are all alike, you can do the same things, but you can use PowerShell for that. And uh, additionally, this week, uh, Sidecore also released an Azure Toolkit, and it contains Sidecore commandlets uh, that you can use to provision your environment as well. I'm not going to show you these, uh, they're so new to me that I didn't have time to figure out. It, it does exactly the same as what I'm going to show you, but I'm going to show you the manual configuring of the uh, ARM templates where the command uh, lets you put in the parameters and fires the command for you. It's, it's actually quite a lot. Um, what the uh, Azure Toolkit also does for you, and I think that's pretty cool, is um, uh, you can create the web deploy packages uh, with, these, uh, with this toolkit and uh, uh, boss released a blog about this, uh, I think, last night, <laughs> uh, on how you can use that. And that's what, something I'm not going to show you, I didn't look, look into yet, so if you want to know more about that, you can check it. Um, the Azure commandlets are also quite easy to use. Uh, you can just install them like this, install module Azure Resource Manager, and they install module Azure. And if you do that, please make sure your ex execution policy is high enough uh, I put it on all sites and then it works uh, wonderfully well. It's very easy to use. So, coming to the deployment itself, or the provisioning, I should say, um, everything you have to do fits on this one slide. So this is all. You have to inject your MongoDB connection strings into the ARM template parameter file. You have to enter the username and the password for your SQL Azure database. Not existing credentials, but new <coughs> credentials for your newly provisioned environment. Um, you have to point the PowerShell script to the correct ARAM template because you can pick one. Uh, on GitHub, there's XP1C, XM1, and also an XP0, I guess, but I'm using the full XP right now. Um, and you have to enter the name for your resource group, a location you want to provision in, and your Azure subscription ID, and you run the script. And that's really all there is to. So that was easy. Um, let's uh, let's go to the demo and actually start doing what I just told. Was so easy. So I hope now everything goes well. Um, I said a, a small demo project. Yes. Um, which is just a small repository uh, with everything in it I uh, I have used. Um, we have the. Uh, and I have to use this one, the release one. This is actually all you need in a RAM template or scripting. In here, I have the uh, Azure Deploys with JSON, which is the, the a RAM template itself. Um, and I have a parameter file. I'm going to pick them up. Yes. This is the Azure Deploy uh, ARM template, and it contains all the setting and the dependencies between uh, the instances. And this is the parameter file. And this is what you go. Uh, you need to do. You need to uh, provision uh, uh, your connection strings for MongoDB. You need to come up with a login for SQL, which this will use to provision the, the SQL databases. And you need to come up with um, the blob storage location or any location you store your Sidecore web deploy package in. What is a web deploy package? A Sidecore web deploy package is actually a default web deploy package. And I've uh, stored it in here so you can see what's in there. 
In the content, you have just the web root. You go, this is the vanilla site for installation. Then, there is the deckpack files that contain uh, the databases you need, and they are uh, in the, uh, the, uh, the Sitecore web deploy package that's, uh, that's delivered by Sitecore. So obviously, if you're going to use this uh, method, you're always going to uh, put up new databases, clean ones. And that's also the reason I think you don't use this uh, for deploying your changes. You deploy, use this to, to provision your initial environment, and then um, update it afterwards, or you can change them and leave the deck packs out, or create different ones, one for initial provisioning, and a second one uh, that you alter for each new deployment. And you're, you're free on that, um, and, and I, I'm still experimenting with this, and I know other people are as well. So it's finding a way on how to use these. Um, for this demo, it, it's actually quite easy because the, the deck packs, you can also use them to install the databases locally, and that's what I've done. I've used this web root in here to set up a local environment, and I just made a, a, a default solution um, with, uh, with an outside web root uh, um, it's a studio project. Um, I don't think that's, uh, that's interesting to go into. Um, and um, uh, I've used that to set up Visual Studio, which I'm going to start right now. Uh, meanwhile, I can go back to the ARM template. Um, these web deploy packages, uh, you can download them on dev.signcode.net. Can you yes. zoom in a little? Yeah, of course. I don't say, of course. But. Uh, then I have to, to take a look. Anyone knows where it is in this tool? Links on the no. by the arches. Ah. Ah. Sorry. Come on. Uh, you have to you have to believe me. <laughs> um, the uh, the default sign for web deploy packages are already um, are already available on uh, dev.signcore.net, so you can just download them and use the <coughs> vanilla ones, or you can create your, your own uh, with the uh, wiki as a toolkit. And I just uploaded the default ones from Sitecore into a blob storage of my own in the Azure portal and used the link I've generated over there. So this also allows for changing the number of packages you use and what's in there. And then there's Another cool thing, I think it's the end of the Sitecore admin B login, the B password, because you can now uh, enter a, a, a value for your new uh, provision environment, so you will not get a default B password. And I tried, B doesn't work because it needs to be eight characters long, so I was a bit sentimental last night. <laughs> um, but oh well. This is, this is actually all the configuration you have to do. Um, the next step is that we go to um, to the PowerShell script. Of course, you have to put on your own license over there. Uh, it's a it's bring your own license with Signcore still. And um, we're going to edit the PowerShell script. I think it goes into my left screen. It's open here. And what's in there is, um, it's pointing towards the ARM template we've seen. And you can put in a name. Um, currently, 12 is already running in the background because we, we wouldn't uh, go and wait 20 minutes over here. It's, it's 20, 25 minutes, of which 80% of the time is being uh, used by the Reddish cache to provision. That's, uh, that's taking up the most time. Um, a location, which I've uh, picked uh, West Europe over here, and your the subscription ID. Um, then what you also can do is you can use search principles to log in automatically. If you uh, are going to use this uh, template within your continuous uh, um, integration uh, tooling, then you really want to use the search principle. Uh, for now, I'm going to omit, uh, omit those and it's going to pop up a login, and I can log in for my PowerShell, but if you want to automate this, you can, do, you can use that. And 
and there's a nice link in it with more info on that. By the way. Um, so this is actually all the config, uh, the, what we have to do in configuring. Um, I have used. Okay. Ah, let's switch everything to the other screen. Sign in. Nice responsive website by Emma. <laughs> Um, uh, take a look at this. Um, I'm not sure you know, but it's really cool. Uh, MLOP also offers you a free tier uh, that you can use for your development and research and development. Stuff. So, uh, of course, uh, you can use MLOP for your production databases, but if you uh, create a new database and you go to single nodes, then there's the sandbox and it's, it's a free tier, so you can use that to experiment. Um, that's what I've done. Um, it's only entering a name for your database and that's all there is to It's really easy. Um, and I've uh, created the analytics tracking contact history and live database assigned for needs. And uh, when you have done so, you will get uh, connection string and you can put those in your area and put play to parameter file. That's what you do. Um, and that's actually, I, I can't talk any longer about this, that's, that's really all there is. Uh, I'm going to run the script to show you what's needed. Um, and then we're going to switch to the uh, environment already created. Um, what I said, I'm not using a uh, search principle, so I need to log in over here. Cool, but that was not the field I was looking for. <laughs> Is it B? No, <laughs> I use hashes, so I don't know it by heart. Um, it logs in, it checks if the resource group already exists because it creates a new resource group otherwise and starts provisioning everything in there. Um, and there's a, an important value over here, it's provisioning state and it succeeded. But when your provisioning fails, it's going to switch to failed. But in the end of the default script time it provides, there's always a printout, deployment successful. But it doesn't matter what happens, it will say deployment successful. So don't look at what, what, what's coming up on the bottom of the script. As you have to scroll up again when you're ready provisioning and look at the provisioning state and that actually tells you that actually tells you if uh, everything has gone, uh, gone well. Um, so, and this is like 20-25 minutes. Um, we're going to switch to, uh, to the Azure portal where it mag magically already is. Um, oh. Core Master Reporting and Web. 
um, you have uh, Azure Search, you have the Redis Cache, Application Insights, then you have your application plans uh, of each role, and then you have the different roles. Um, when I click on a uh, when I click on a web app, I can look into it. I see the URL and I can browse through it. And this is the initial provisioning state signed for. Yes. What? Not entirely true. I added something uh, to it with Unicorn on web apps. That's my own addition. That was to test that my deployment works, uh, which I'm going to show you right now. Start. Open the project, uh, and in the meantime, I'm going to show you how quick it is to uh, scale this. I'm going to content management, or maybe rather for the demo, it's okay, but it would be more logical to scale this one. Um, and you go to scale out app service plan, and you can pick the metrics I was talking about. You can say, I want at least two machines. A maximum of six, and you need to stay behind below like 75% or something. Yeah, um, and this is all now it's scaled up. I, have, I now have two, insta uh, two, yeah, two instances running, and it will scale up when they get busy. Um, so, this is really easy and far easier than it was with cloud services. Um, what also is cool is um, you can't uh, go into the machine anymore and test anything out yourself. Um, but I needed to, a way to show you how quick deployment is. Uh, and I wanted to do this with the least uh, amount of changes. So I went to the content management machine, uh, or instance I should say. And when you click on more, you can download the publishing profile. So from Visual Studio, you can import this and directly deploy it to, uh, to this instance. And the second thing I did, because the connection string is built up by the ARAM script, so you, you actually do not know uh, how it came out. And so I, I found this little trick of um, where it is, uh, going into the machine, and I know it's kind of a hack, but it works. Um, you can go to the uh, file system um, and you can type the connection string config and I copy this in my uh, slow cheetah translation and now with only those two steps I can deploy to my web. Of course, for a live environment I wouldn't do this, I was uh, use continuous integration and know what, what my uh, connection string came out to be. But for this, it worked wonderfully well. Um, I've pasted this into Visual Studio. You can see over here, I have the publishing profile I have imported, and I have uh, the connection strings. Um, these are just, just the vanilla default ones that I've used, because I used the web route that was in the Design for Webflow package. Um, I have the Azure one, which I took from the server itself, and um, then <coughs> Uh, I have the one that I use locally to deploy them. So uh, with only these steps, I can publish to my local development environment, make changes, um, and I can go to my web app. Um, and it's just right. That's fine. This is better. And I can now deploy to it. And it actually only takes, well, a minute. Uh, meanwhile, I can tell that uh, the data folder location changed. It used to be next to the website route, uh, and now it has been moved to the uh, data folder. And it's a logical place because uh, this is already uh, finished, and on my other screen, it automatically opens up uh, the newly deployed website. So you can see this is really fast. If you only deploy the delta to it, it's way faster. I'm, I'm not sure who of you or already have done cloud system deployment, but there's way more into it than this. Um, coming back to the app data folder, in the app data folder you had your log files, they're not used because it's application inside. In the data folder you had your Lucene indexes, also gone because it uses a uh, search. Uh, so the only thing is you have your license file, and uh, in this demo I have my unicorn uh, uh, files in it. So over here you can see 
the unicorn files. Um, what I did to, uh, to include them is um, you have to pick a location where you store these because um, in, the, in, the, in the previous approach, when the data folder was next to your website, your Unicode files were in there, in the data folder, and when you run your website locally, you run from website, you would fill the serialization folder. It, it didn't have anything to do with your solution. Your Unicode was not in your solution. Right now, because of you are deploying from Visual Studio, and it doesn't matter if you create a web deploy package or use go, for example, to generate all the stuff, or you uh, publish directly what I'm doing right now, um, your data folder is in your solution as well, and you need to deploy it from there. So you need to pick a location where you store it and share it between your solution and your website folder. Um, and that's one thing I, I now did by... Um, Some facts and figures. Um, 
Key replication, you don't actually need it because uptime is already quite high, and only if you're concerned that a whole data center goes offline, then Cyclone tells you to use G replication. Uh, by the way, it's not supported yet. It will come in the next release. Um, the integrations we've seen, like uh, application insights and search, uh, you can use them, uh, but you can also use uh, alternatives like Solar, Coveo, we'll see not anymore, at least not if you're using WebS. If you're using 8.2.1 and you're using an on-premise environment, then we'll see more perfectly suit in smaller environments or at least your development. Um, but you can also use these uh, Azure Search and Application Insights uh, combined with your on-premise environment. So you don't have to use web apps. You can also choose to um, to improve your environment and, and the flexibility, uh, the ease of monitoring and maintenance by using Azure Search and Redish with 8.2.1 on your um, on-premise, secure on-premise or VM environment. Um, the consumption-based licensing is recommended for movement to Azure apps, of course, because you then can use the scaling. If you don't, you still have a lot of benefits from this new technology. Uh, but if you want to use the scaling, then you need to, uh, to have the consumption-based license model. Um, by the way, the staging slot doesn't count. So if you have a customer that has, for example, two uh, licenses for uh, two instances for your content delivery, uh, you can still use this. You can't scale up, but you have two uh, instances, and you can use the staging slot as well. Uh, so that's very nice. Uh, one month ago, it didn't look like this, and it did look like they were also going to charge you with a server-based consumption, uh, server-based model, the perpetual model. But um, but this is some some interesting news. Makes the transition easier. So some limitations. Um, if you have really large environments, like more than thousand fields in your search or a very large database, I also think I think that fifty uh, or yeah, 50 gigabytes is already quite large. I'm not sure anyone has one terabyte database. But, um, it, it's advisable to check your limitations up front. But not for all environments, it's suitable to move to web apps. And maybe you can then use uh, a virtual machine combined with the new integrations that 8.21 offers. Um, the porting is something you have to do yourself. It, there's no... Um, upgrade module or, or um, support from Cycle on that. Um, your environment or your architecture should be stateless, of course, because WebEx is uh, fully stateless. Uh, you cannot easily install additional software, of course, when you have software and you put it, I see Bob smiling because I know, <laughs> if, if, you, if you put additional uh, tooling into your Cycle web deploy package or you expand your provisioning, then, then you will be able to do so, but you cannot install locally on the machine. Uh, no access to the registry, no access to the... Um, um, or it's a shared disk, so you have to be careful with, with, with the dependencies you have on your disk. And there's some limitation on the drawing framework, uh, drawing APIs, but uh, I'm not sure uh, if we can do that. The advice sizings, I will not go through them, <coughs> There is an advice sizing for all the web roles uh, and all the services you're going to use. And this is the minimum that will work. Uh, and of course, you can scale up from here. This is the roadmap that Signcor has. Um, in the update one, we see the additional Azure resources and a few ARM templates. Um, it will also be available in the marketplace. I see November's. 2016, that's already updated. Um, in the following updates, they will improve that and will extend the templates with other seeds as well, the, the one to five sizings uh, for, uh, for the Expedia seeds. And they will start adding support for the products like uh, web forms for marketers and SXA, for example. So this, of course, is not there yet. <coughs> In 8.3, uh, I, I, I hope there will be a little bit more than this, but this is what they share right now. Uh, enhancements. Let's call it enhancements. <laughs> um, so 
So what's next? Um, I, I want to, it's really fresh, it's really new what we're seeing. We only have been experimenting this very short. So um, and so I want to, to go and look further in how to, uh, how to get the ultimate setup. Uh, I have to say that my previous Azure Cloud Services uh, blog is deprecated because it's focused on cloud services. I still get some questions about that, but it's, I'm going to keep it there. But it's not uh, very useful for new releases. If you have an old environment or you want to fix something in an old environment, it could be interesting. And I did a blog on Azure Web Apps, uh, a sort of uh, kind of an introduction. Um, I will, everything I, I, I've been showing you right here, I will also post on my blog and I will also uh, share the screencast. Um, and then I will start uh, working on the ultimate continuous delivery for Cypher Web Apps. I want to really find out, is it better to expand your initial provisioning? Do you want to uh, expand your deployment? Where do you put, put stuff? Uh, do you put your Unicorn installation in your, uh, in your provisioning or in your deployment? Um, that's something we have to work out, we have to find out, and I will talk about what, I, what, we, what we will discover. And I want to build and set up a showcase deployment environment and, and share that in the community. And, and I hope that any of you will join because we really want to step up and create a baseline that everyone can use and is the best practice shared uh, among all of us. Um, so that's, that's my goal. Uh, I have included some resources, not for looking into right now, but if I share this uh, presentation, you can look into it. Uh, something about the marketplace, templates, uh, application insights and search, of course, uh, but also more stuff on remote debugging and, and, and troubleshooting and debugging your cloud systems and VM. So, that was it. Um, any questions left? If the disk is shared between instances in a certain role, uh, how does it use it for the media cache? Because the media cache creates all the files. Yeah, good question. I don't know yet. There are a few questions I have, I have regarding this because I also know that uh, at least H1 has in the configuration um, a differentiation between the different instances within a role. So uh, XDB could, uh, knows on which server you've uh, uh, been coming from. And that, that's really, it, it was in the documentation. I, I didn't find uh, found out how they are going to cope with this, but they obviously have to move that out there. And, and, and that's something I, I still want to test. And the media cache is also a very good question. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, future upgrades? Like if there's a new version of Sidecore, uh, Will Sidecore provide the same upgrade instructions as, as you have now, or should those be a bit different for, uh, for this type of environment? Future um, enhancements. Sorry? <laughs> Future enhancements. Yeah, okay. So uh, Robin is asking what um, uh, what do we do when we get a new Sidecore version? Um, I expect Sidecore to, uh, to get us to reprovision the new version and deploy our own delta over that and change our uh, local environment based on the same instructions we've got before. So um, I think picking up your stuff and uh, moving it over for, onto the next version instead of converting your existing, that, that I, I think that will be, become the policy. I had a discussion today also with some colleagues about what we do with the database then. And um, what, what I think um, Menno told me is that it will probably, if, if, you, if you look at Helix, uh, it, it could be like that they expect you to use a new database provision it and move all your stuff over to the other one. I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's an exciting step and I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm uh, uh, um, how do you say, if I'm confident with, with doing it like that, but that's, uh, that's the way it's going to be, uh, I guess, yeah. In the new publishing service, how do you fit in this? <coughs> Good one. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah, they did an investment right now. They, they want to get yeah. to work on Azure first, and the second step is public shows. Okay, so they just put up a lot of virtual machine then. Yeah. yeah. But I heard from Camrose that it, uh, the publishing shows took a lot of money uh, away from his account, so <laughs> that's probably the reason they didn't release it. Yeah, it's not, it's not in release yet. There's no documentation about it, so 
if you if you talk to psych people, you may get to know some. Uh, I think. Well, I was expecting maybe yeah. that they use uh, web jobs within the Azure website. That would be nice. But until now, I think it's if you if you really want to use it, uh, and spin up a VM and put it on there. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, the Azure search is also um, uh, supports like the custom indexes and stuff. Yeah. 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 It's a full uh, support of everything. Yeah. Okay. And I'm still uh, figuring out what the cost would be of that because. I suppose that because Cypher does index a lot and does have a lot of requests to indexing, that it's harder to predict. And I'm talking with Microsoft right now uh, and, and, and ask them to help me in um, um, uh, actually knowing what to tell customers and, uh, and instead of using a VM and so on, for example. Yeah. And do you have an estimation of how much uh, the setup you just showed? Cost like the, the before service. Quite, quite, quite a lot. Well, I think I ran this demo for two weeks, and it took out maybe two hundred euros of my budget. Okay. That's that's also uh, taking out services in between and putting more back because you were trying out a lot. I was trying service. out, but not. I I think not a lot. I think I reprovisioned it like yeah. Well, you you've seen it. Yeah. I'm I'm on thirteen right now, so yeah. I did this like. <laughs> It was my, uh, and, and this is actually a demo, so my first trial was like eight times, I, I, I practiced it eight times, tested it out, um, and so of course that generated some traffic, more traffic than you would usually, but furthermore it's an environment that completely at rest, so there's no activity on it, no indexing whatsoever, so I think it's quite, it's quite extensive, and for smaller customers in smaller environments you would not really require uh, all the different setups and you could combine roles for your web apps yeah. and you could also combine the database setup and then then you have to go into the ARM templates and change stuff yourself. Yeah. So that's why I mentioned it as, as being a boilerplate the starting point. Yeah. If you want to uh, play around with these Azure templates, the first thing you should do after provisioning is scale down your SQL server. Yeah. Because that one takes a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. What is it used? <coughs> Sorry, which one is it used by default? Uh, um, knowledge. An expensive. <laughs> Very expensive. Okay. I'm going to look that up. It's, it's quite fast to see that. That's one. Is it is it already in the screen? Price of tears. Yeah, that's one. Yeah, you could go over it in there. Well, a question but for people wanting to try. Um, I used the script yesterday and I could get it running on Azure Stack. So. Yeah, that's an option as well, Azure Stack. Oh, and there's one more thing I have to say. Uh, when you, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but if you go in the ARM uh, template, uh, then there's a hidden <coughs> variable uh, and the location insights of location. Um, I've set the default value to West Europe, but the default value is not West Europe, um, and it's I think it's East U uh, US. Um, so when you do not change anything, that one will provisioned in uh, in, uh, East, in the United States. So you can either change it over here, what I did in this kind of quick and dirty, or you can go in here and set it uh, with the additional parameters. And, Override the uh, the variable. <coughs> yeah. Uh, I've done uh, a few tests lately uh, mm -hmm. about uh, Azure SQL and uh, Azure SQL just on hosted on a VM. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Azure SQL database was like cost wisely uh, much more, uh, but performed less. Uh, why is it like uh, advised at the uh, uh, web Plan because it, it made a lot of difference in money. <coughs> yeah, and I think a lot of that, and that's not really side core, but it's more like Microsoft Azure related. A lot of services, when you compare them and you use them the same as you used to before, it's going to be more expensive. But it's also easier to set up. It doesn't cost you any maintenance. Your uh, operating system is patched. Uh, security is uh, 
is arranged. So uh, you're going to cut down on your maintenance cost, and also uh, you can uh, turn things off when you do not use them. Um, for example, at one customer we're looking at, okay, if you have a test environment, only spin it up if you want to start testing and, uh, and switch it off afterwards. And if you use it like that, it will be, uh, it will be more cost effective. Yeah. But, but, but it's, it, the ease of use and the scalability is, uh, is the primary reason for using it. Yeah, okay, scalability is a good reason. Yeah. But I've also like, um, uh, investigated the, the VM a bit, and mm -hmm. if you just like uh, set up uh, the SQL VM from the Azure Marketplace, you mm -hmm. can uh, turn on a setting like out of Betsy, so you don't have to maintain the server. Yeah, yeah well but that would be that cool. would be a nice alternative, and that yeah. that, that fits into the um, into what I mentioned that you can change it to your own needs, and I think you can uh, scale it down a bit uh, for your. Uh, No more questions? Okay. Thank you. And uh, if you have any other things, please share it with me with the ideas or feedback on how you can do things better. I, I would very much uh, like to know that.